Republican Senator Chuck Grassley repeatedly alleged wrongdoing by the president's son, Hunter Biden, during the past year. Taking to the Senate floor, the Iowa Republican has detailed the alleged shady business deals, many of them international, engaged in by the younger Biden while his father was vice president. Republicans have long claimed that Hunter Biden, as well as the president's brother James and potentially Joe Biden himself, have engaged in corrupt behavior. Hunter Biden has admitted to past struggles with substance abuse, but has steadfastly claimed that he has never engaged in improper business dealings. His father has long stood by his side as well. Thank you, Madam President. This week, news reports made public in May 2019 subpoena from the Justice Department. That subpoena requested financial records relating to Hunter Biden as part of the department's criminal investigation into his activities. Notably, that subpoena also requested records relating to James Biden, Devin Archer, and Eric Schwerin. That subpoena sought records relating to companies that Senator Johnson and I discussed in our Biden report. If the reports are accurate, this subpoena is yet another stake in the heart of a totally unsubstantiated claim made by the liberal media and Democrats that the Grassley-Johnson report on Biden was Russian disinformation. Today, I come here to speak about a matter directly related to the re re recent news, specifically the Biden Justice Department's failure to answer fundamental questions related to Hunter's criminal investigation. I've asked serious ethical questions of the Justice Department that the department so far has refused to answer. In fact, the department has actually publicly contradicted itself. Just one example of contradiction. On May 31st, 2021, Senator Johnson and I wrote to Attorney General Garland. Our letter noted that Hunter Biden had a close association with Patrick Ho, an individual who's associated with the communist Chinese government and its intelligence services. Patrick Ho was also charged and convicted of international bribery and money laundering offenses relating to his work for companies connected to that communist regime. After his arrest, his first call was reportedly to James Biden, President Biden's brother. Hunter Biden reportedly represented Patrick Ho for $1 million. In our letter, we noted that a Justice Department federal court filing said DOJ had FISA information on Patrick Ho. Not only did they possess this information that, uh, that the department informed the court that they intended to use it to prosecute that person. Senator jo Johnson and I asked the Justice Department for that FISA information, as well as FISA information for other Chinese nationalists linked to Hunter Biden. In response, I quote, the Justice Department. Unfortunately, under the circumstances described in your letter, we aren't in a position to confirm the existence of the information that is sought if it exists in the department's possession, end of quote. Now get that, if it exists in the department's possession. Simply put, that is not true, an accurate statement. 
unless the department's statement to the federal court in the Patrick Ho matter wasn't true and accurate. So then as we naturally follow up on November the 15th, 2021, we asked Attorney General Garland to explain the discrepancy. No response to this very day. Both statements can't be true. Either the department possesses the information or it doesn't possess the information. So we can le legitimately ask Attorney General Garland again, what's your answer? Now, this doesn't end there with that question. On February the 3rd, 2021, and March the 9th, 2021, Senator Johnson and I asked Attorney General Garland if Nicholas McQuaid is recused from the Hunter Biden criminal case. Now, this McQuaid works in the department's criminal division, but worked with Hunter Biden's criminal attorneys before joining the department. This poses a clear conflict of interest. Attorney General Garland has refused to answer to this very day. On June the 29th, 2021, Senator Johnson and I asked Attorney General Garland whether Susan Hennessy, a National Security Division employee, is recused from the Durham investigation. Before working for the department, she made negative comments about the Durham investigation. In Attorney General Garland's July 13, 2021 response letter, he failed to answer our questions. However, as the Senate Judiciary Committee at the committee's oversight hearing, October the 27th, 21, the Attorney General said she, quote, has nothing whatsoever to do with the Durham investigation, end quote. Although this statement doesn't fully answer our questions, such as whether she's been formally recused from the matter, it, it's more than what we were provided in the department letter's response. Likewise, the Justice Department said that Margaret Goodlander, quote, has no role in Mr. Durham's investigation, end quote. She's married to Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan. Sullivan worked for the Clinton presidential campaign. While there, he peddled the false Alpha Bank story about the Trump organization having a secret back channel to this Russian bank. Those false allegations were reviewed as part of Crossfire Hurricane. Now, with all that said, let's take stock of where we are. On the one hand, Attorney General Garland has publicly said Susan Hennessy and Margaret Goodlander have no roles in the during investigation. On the other hand, Attorney General Garland refuses to say the same for McQuaid and the Hunter Biden criminal investigation. So we can really ask, why is it that way? Why won't the Attorney General say that McQuaid has no role in the criminal case involving the President's son? Because this is a fundamental ethical question. Our letters have provided Attorney General Garland the opportunity to hit the ball right out of the park. Instead, he doesn't even try to make a swing. What's the Biden Justice Department hiding? This blatantly inconsistent treatment 
has cast a cloud over Hunter Biden's criminal case. Just imagine if this fact pattern had involved between President Trump and his sons, the media would have gone nuts over. You wouldn't hear the end of it. Also, from my Democratic colleagues here in the Senate, yet not a sound from them, not a peep. The American people are rightly skeptical of how the Justice Department is handling the Hunter Biden criminal investigation. And the secrecy and the lack of public transparency will only increase the skepticism, skepticism that the American people have. So I and Senator Johnson won't stop doing good government oversight on this issue. The American people deserve answers, one way or another. Madam, Pres or Madam President, on another point, and a shorter point, I'd like to take a moment to update my colleagues on a bill that I introduced in 2021 designed to fight counterfeits. As we all know, counterfeits are a threat to the United States economic and national security interest. Most counterfeits originate in China, one of our largest competitors. Counterfeits are dangerous to consumers. And lastly, counterfeits rip off American ingenuity and result in billions of dollars in losses. For these reasons, Congress must ensure the federal government arms its partners with the tools and the resources that these people need to combat the bad guys who sell these fake goods. My bill has the number S1159, and it does just that. It gives the partners the tools and resources they need to combat the bad guys. Now, it happens that S1159 was incorporated in the United States Innovation and Competition Act of 2021 that passed this Senate on a very bipartisan vote. It was a bipartisan, uh, the bill with that title, Innovation and Cooperation Competition Act, was an effort in a bipartisan way to crack down on China. Now, the bill that I am telling you I co-sponsored as part of that gives our U.S. Customs and Border Protection, CBP, authority to share more information with the private sector on counterfeits identified at the border. It also gives Customs and Border Protection the authority to share information with other parties, like e-commerce parties and shipping carriers. Sharing information then creates a more secure trade ecosystem that keeps counterfeits out of our country. This is good common sense policy. Now, my colleagues may be asking themselves, why is this really needed? Well, Customs and Border Protection believes that the Trade Secrets Act keeps this agency from sharing certain types of information with the private sector. This keeps American companies then in the dark and prevents these companies from pursuing the bad guys who rip them off. Indeed, companies have repeatedly told me that if they just had more information from the federal government, they would, they would and could keep more counterfeits out of the United States. So my bill removes this barrier and specifically gives 
Customs Border Patrol the authority that it needs to share information with the private sector. Now here is the icing on the cake. Recently, Customs Border Patrol Protection confirmed that my bill would, re would quote, resolve their concerns about violating the Trade Secrets Act and would permit the sharing of more information, end of quote, on counterfeits. And a few weeks ago, Congressional Budget Office confirmed that my bill will cost, will cost absolutely nothing. So good government legislation that costs the taxpayers zero dollars ought to not raise any questions when it protects the consumer and protects our business people. That is what I would like to call a slam dunk. And I hope my colleagues will join me in making sure that it gets past this Congress. And now, since this has become an issue in the House of Representatives, I hope that the House wakes up to this common sense policy being included in the China package as negotiations continue, because they left it out in the version that has come to the House floor now. I yield the floor, and I suggest the absence of a quorum. It's been a year since we in the Senate confirmed Merrick Garland to be Attorney General. During his confirmation hearing, I outlined what a successful Department of Justice looks like and what I expected of him as our new Attorney General. I gave him the answers to the test. By this rubric, he has failed. For instance, I urged him to build off the successes from the previous Justice Department to reduce crime, maintain the rule of law, and protect our civil liberties. But violent crime continues to rise, the rule of law is undermined, and our civil liberties are endangered. Instead of condemning all violent crime, Attorney General Garland's Justice Department targets lawful gun owners and blames those gun owners on the rising murder rates, carjackings, and attacks against law enforcement. But the explosion of crime in blue cities is exact, actually tied to depleasing measures, hiring progressive prosecutors, and enacting disastrous bail reform policies. Lawful gun owners are not to blame for this rise in crime. And in the midst of a crime spike, a number of Biden appointees and judicial nominees, strongly backed by the Attorney General Garland, have supported radical ideas in the past like defunding the police or at least reducing funding for police. And some have even advocated not prosecuting certain crimes. So how do you expect to effectively fight crime with a lineup that I just gave you? Instead of tackling the opioid crisis, the Garland Justice Department wants to make it easier for fentanyl traffickers to spread their poison. Fentanyl analogs are responsible for most overdose deaths and are lethal in very tiny amounts, as we all know. But the Garland and Biden administration support eliminating mandatory minimum for these fentanyl analog dealers. Really? In addition, Garland has wielded his power to undermine the rule of law 
and cave to political pressures. The Attorney General has summarily reversed a number of decisions issued by Attorney Gen Attorneys General Sessions and Barr that helped enhance the integrity of our asylum system. This Attorney General has also issued memos, interpretations, and filings to the Supreme Court that contrast with previous Department of Justice positions. Let me give you an example. His uh, Department of Justice reinterpretation reinterpreted the law to make sure that inmates released to home confinement under COVID relief stay there. His Solicitor General also switched positions on a cocaine sentencing case that was before the Supreme Court. Now it happens that both of these policy outcomes align with my positions. I agree with those outcomes, but his way of getting there is political. Rule of law must be consistent and not political. So Garland's flip-flopping also jeopardizes our nation's security. Instead of protecting the American people from the Chinese Communist Party's espionage, he disbanded the previous administration's successful China initiatives. This program prioritized investigations of national security from China, which is still a very serious threat given that the FBI opens a new Chinese espionage case every 12 hours. So I don't know why this would be disbanded. This move is concerning and dangerous to our national security and reflective of partisan pre pressures trumping smart law enforcement. Also, political decisions are getting in the way of the application, consistent application of the rule of law. For example, Attorney General Garland's Department of Justice is politically selective about which cases to pursue and which cases to dismiss. Despite the 100 night siege against the Portland Courthouse in 2020 and 96 people being charged as violent rioters, almost half of those charged have been dismissed. Compare this to the Department of Justice's own statement on the one year anniversary of January 6th, quote, the Department of Justice's resolve to hold accountable those who committed crimes on January the 6th, 2021, has not and will not wane, end of quote. Now we all know that those who break law should be held accountable. No question about that. And as our nation's top law enforcement officer, it's incumbent upon him to enforce the rule of law. He cannot pick and choose when the rule of law is politically convenient or easy. Under Garland's leadership, the Department of Justice is also undermining valuable civil rights. This is something that he and I have had a lot of discussions on as he's appeared before our committee. So, undermining valuable, valuable civil rights. So instead of prioritizing that, Attorney General Garland has chilled the speech of American parents. He sent a memo to the FBI and the U.S. attorneys around the country to be on the lookout for upset parents at school boards. He did this after the National School Boards Association 
suggested that some people should be branded domestic terrorists. Imagine that charge, that you go to a school board meeting, you might be a domestic terrorist. What's even worse, there seems to be some evidence that the Secretary of Education may have asked the National School Board Association to write that awful letter, which the association later had to apologize for. Garland says his memo was just about violence and threats of violence, but sure enough, whistleblower reports show that the FBI's counterterrorism division was looking way beyond only violence and threats. Parents' ability to voice their concerns, especially now, is a precious right, and the Department of Justice's actions cannot chill such vital speech constitutionally protected by the First Amendment. Also, instead of being responsive, the Attorney General has been evasive. Last year, I sent approximately 50 letters to the Department. That's one-third of all letters that they received from members of the United States Senate. The Attorney General wanted me to know that I sent one-third of all the letters he got from the other 99 senators. So when the Attorney General told me that, I don't think he meant it as a compliment. I've received some letters in response. However, when I'm told that I, they've responded to me, simple or lots of words on a piece of paper don't in and of themselves make a letter responsive. Furthermore, the department has failed to provide responsive records, with the exception of one or two small productions. By the way, of example, I received a 30-page production of records from the department. It included improper FOIA redactions and failed to include the necessary spreadsheets. Accordingly, that production is a failed production because FOIA does not apply to documents going to the Congress of the United States, so you shouldn't have that redaction. Also, I've repeatedly asked Nick, if Nicholas McQuaid is recused from the Hunter Biden criminal investigation and that's an important thing because he seemed to work in the law firm that was representing Hunter Biden. And it, it ought to be a simple question to answer, but Attorney General Garland refuses to tell me whether McQuaid has recused from those cases. At the Judiciary Committee's October 27th, 2021 Justice Department oversight hearing, I said to Attorney General Garland, quote, when I placed holes on your nominees for the department's failure to comply with Republican oversight requests, I said either you run the department or the department runs you. Right now, it looks like the Justice Department is running you, end of my quote of October 27th last year. So that statement still holds true. Instead of protecting the American people, the Attorney General is sacrificing our nation's top law enforcement agency to politics during a violent crime spike. Instead of being stewards of our nation's laws, the Attorney General's leading the charge upending the rule of law. And instead of fighting for civil rights, he's chipping away at those civil rights. Attorney General Garland, there is still time to change. You have three years left in this administration 
I urge you to change course. I urge you to bring the Justice Department back to a place of leadership, leadership in reducing violent crime, leadership in maintaining the rule of law, and leadership in protecting our civil liberties. I yield the floor. With that objection. Yesterday, Senator Johnson and I discussed our joint investigation into the Biden family's foreign financial entanglements. We reviewed much of our earlier work and provided a brief preview of the new material. Today, we will give our second speech on our Biden investigation series. Once again, we're going to make public and we're going to describe new financial records relating to Hunter Biden and his connections to the communist Chinese government. Most of that focus will be on his connections to the CEFC, a company that's effectively an arm of the Chinese government. But first, we must go back to 2015. At that time, Hunter Biden served on the board of Burisma and was paid ten, tens of thousands of dollars each month. Its owner was a corrupt Russian-aligned Ukra Ukrainian oligarch. But that's not all that Hunter Biden was up to. In that year, CEFC International announced an agreement with Northern International Capital Holding. Northern International is incorporated in China, and it's very much involved in the energy sector. One of Yi Jingming's companies was the majority shareholder of uh, CEFC International. Northern International purchased $123 million worth of CEFC's shares, binding the two, country, two companies <clears throat> together. We must also mention Hudson West III and its financial connection to CEFC. Hunter Biden was an investor and a manager of Hudson West III. He was tasked with advancing its interest. Hudson West III also involved Chinese nationals connected to the communist regime, such as Gong Wen Gong, whom I talked about yesterday. Now let's look at this first poster. And I should note that Senator Johnson and I will make these documents public in full. We're providing snapshots for our presentation here on the floor of the United States Senate. Here we have one portion of an LLC agreement from a bank. It shows the companies that have bound themselves together, Hudson West 5, Hudson West 3, and Owasco. Owasco is Hunter Biden's firm. Now let's turn to the second poster. The paragraph at the top shows the purpose for which the LC, LLC agreement exists. So what this tells us is that Hunter Biden and James Biden linked up with companies connected to the communist regime to assist them with finding projects for global and domestic infrastructure energy. And as we know from my and Senator Johnson's report from last August, 
some energy projects, explorations between the Biden family and China were here in the United States. One example is a multi-million dollar natural gas project in Louisiana. Now let's move to the next paragraph at the bottom of this same poster, which defines the word affiliate in the agreement. And I want to quote, for the avoidance of doubt, CFC China Energy Company Limited or any of its affiliates shall be de -deem, deemed as an affiliate of Hudson, end of quote. Accordingly, this agreement between Hunter Biden's firm and Hudson West 3 and Hudson West 5 directly connect to Hunter Biden to CEFC. So, was this agreement executed? Let's look at this third poster, which contains a signature block executing the agreement. Here we see Hunter Biden's signature with Gong Wan Dong. As previously noted, Gong Wan was an associate of Yi Jing Ming. Both men were connected to the communist regime, including its military elements. Notably, Hunter Biden worked for Yi Jing Ming to get him involved in the natural gas project in Louisiana. That project eventually fell through. Now let's bring up a fourth poster labeled Joinder Agreement relating to the LLC agreement. Again, Hunter Biden is signing with Gong Wen Dong with respect to the LLC agreement. Now, accordingly, we can now conclude the following. Hunter Biden was financially connected to CEFC, a company that was an arm of the communist Chinese regime for the purpose of advancing energy interests. This agreement also shows two additional findings. First, Hunter Biden's responsibility to advance Hudson West 3's interest as of August the 2nd, 2017. Second, Hunter Biden's close associate with Hudson West 3's CEFC and its affiliates as of August the 2nd, 2017. That date is important as I will show you soon. Let's turn to a fifth po poster. On this fifth, fifth poster, look at the top. This is a bank record showing an August 8, 2017 wire transfer from Northern International Capital to Hudson West 3 for $5 million. This is $5 million from a company that's connected to Ying Jing Ming and CEFC and its affiliates, which are essentially arms of the communist Chinese regime. And that transfer took place after Hunter Biden became closely associated with Hudson West 3, as the LLC agreement shows. So, what was the money for? As noted, Hunter Biden was working with Chinese nationals linked to the communist regime to help them explore energy projects. Now look at the bottom of this poster. This is a paragraph from the LLC agreement. 
It shows that Hunter Biden was paid $100,000 per month. James Biden was paid $65,000 per month. And Hunter Biden will be paid a one-time retainer, a fee of $500,000. Again, this is money connected to Hudson West 3, a company connected to CFC and Gong Win Dong. Both are connected in turn to the communist Chinese regime. We can now conclude with this, with this respect to James Biden. James Biden was financially connected to CEFC, a company that was an arm of the communist Chinese regime for the purpose of advancing energy interest. After the LLC agreement was signed, money flowed to, from CFC and its shareholders into the bank account of Hudson West 3, including the five million from Northern International. <clears throat> this LLC agreement was a trigger point for high-dollar financial transactions involving Hunter and James Biden. Now let's turn to poster six and view the top. This is Hudson West 3 Bank record that shows a wire transfer on February, August 31, 2017 for $165,000. Notably, this is the same month as the $5 million wire from Northern International. It is also the same month that Hunter Biden signed the August 2nd, 2017 LLC agreement. The wire is to Wells Fargo Clearing Services. Now look at the bottom of this poster. Senator Johnson and I have acquired more than just the bank statement. We've acquired underlying wire data. So look at the fourth line at the bottom. It says, quote, further credit to Owasco PC, end quote. The underlying wire data, sh data shows that it went to Owasco a Hunter Biden firm. Senator Johnson and I have years of bank records to show multiple $165,000 wire transfers from Hudson West 3 to Owasco. There were also wire transfers for other amounts, some for more, some for less. More likely, some of those payments were for expenses under the LLC agreement. So you have an August 6, 2017 LLC agreement with Hudson West 3 and Owasco noting $165,000 a month to Hunter Biden. Uh, no, that's $100 thousand dollars a month to Hunter Biden and sixty five thousand dollars to James Biden. Then you have an August 8th 2017 wire transfer of five million dollars from Northern International to Hudson West 3. After that August 8th wire you see years of wire transfers from Hudson West 3 to Hunter Biden's company. The majority of these for $165,000, the exact amount due under the LLC agreement. 
based on the timing of the transactions. Hunter Biden and James Biden's payments under the LLC agreement came from that $5 million wire. A wire, mind you, that came from a company connected to Yi Jing Ming and CEFC, which is an arm of the Chinese government. These years of record show that Hunter Biden and James Biden were more connected to the communist regime's elements than had been previously known. These records place them at the center of Hudson West 3, Gong Wen Dong, and CFC. This is a finding that Senator Johnson and I made public in our Biden reports last Congress, the same reports that you found members of the other political party in this body and the liberal press finding fault with that somehow it was Russian disinformation. So I say this to the liberal media and our Democratic colleagues who tried to smear our work all these years and accuse us of peddling Russian disinformation. You've seen all of these documents that we presented. Are these official bank records Russian disinformation? To our Democratic colleagues and the liberal media, we deserve an answer. Because you made several efforts to smear our reputation as we were starting this investigation two or three years ago. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Senator Johnson to discuss a name that I gave you yesterday, Patrick Ho, and related records to Patrick Ho that we've acquired. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Senator from Wisconsin. Senator from Iowa. Today, Senator Johnson and I will present our third speech on the Biden investigation series. Today, we will focus on James Biden, the president's brother. Hunter Biden wasn't the only Biden family member who had connections to the Chinese communist regime. James Biden did as well. Before we begin our discussion, I think we need to mention the main company once again, the Chinese company that goes by the initials CEFC. In the first two speeches, Senator Johnson and I established the connection between CEFC and the communist Chinese government. We established the connection between CEFC and Hudson West 3. We then established the connection with Hunton Biden's Owasco, Hudson West 3, and CEFC. We showed that Hunter Biden and James Biden actively assisted CEFC as it worked to explain, expand its footprint, and its holdings in the global and U.S. energy sector. And today, we'll add James Biden's Lion Hall Group to the list of Biden family companies connected to the communist regime. In my and Senator Johnson's September 23rd 2020 report, we showed that Hunter Biden and James Biden and their aligned firms received approximately four and eight tenths million dollars 
from Hudson West 3 from August 2017 to September 2018. During that same time frame, Hunter Biden's OWASCO sent 20 or so wires to James Biden's Lion Hall group. Those 20 wires totaled just about one and four tenths million dollars. The liberal media and our Democrat, Democrat colleagues originally tr tried to claim that Johnson and my findings were Russian disinformation. Last week, the Washington Post reported the following, quote, over the years of 14 months, no, over the course of 14 months, the Chinese energy conglomerate, here parenthetically they're referring to CEFC, and its executives paid, paid $4.8 million to entities controlled by Hutton, Hunter Biden and his uncle, according to government records, court documents, and newly disclosed bank statements, as well as emails contained on a copy of a laptop hard drive that purportedly once belonged to Hunter Biden, end of quote. <clears throat> the Post also reported this, so I start the quote. During that time period, about 104 million, 1.4 million was transferred from Hunter's account to the Lion Hall Group the consulting firm that James Biden ran, according to other government records, reviewed by the Post, and a Washington Post quote. <clears throat> Senator Johnson and I were right two years ago. We knew it then, but it's been a long road to defend our work product. The liberal media and our Democratic colleagues aggressively tried to make the case that we were peddling Russian disinformation. Now, what will the liberal media and my de Democrat colleagues say now in light of last week's Washington Post article that substantiated the work that Senator Johnson and I have been doing? We still haven't received any apology from our Democratic colleagues for their false claims against us these past several years. They haven't apologized to the American people, and I'm not going to hold my breath. When will the big time media in Washington awaken to respect my reputation for the thorough investigative and oversight work that I do as a senator? And it's also my constitutional responsibility to do exactly that. Now, we have more records to discuss today. Today, Senator Johnson and I will show you financial transfers direct from Hudson West 3 to the Lion Hall Group. In other words, in these transfers, Hunter Biden's OWASCO isn't the middleman. So let's look at the first poster here. This is a January 2018 bank statement from Hudson West 3. Now there's a lot going on here, so I'll just mention several items. First, we've got two examples of more wire transfers from Hudson West 3 for $165,000. The, under, the underlying wire data 
which Senator Johnson and I will make public this very day, shows that money went to Hunter Biden's Owasco. That money was for the August 2017 LLC agreement, which by its terms saw James Biden become a manager of Hudson West Three. That agreement sent $100,000 to Hunter Biden and $65,000 to James Biden every month. Those transactions occurred after the $5 million wire from Northern International Capital to Hudson West Three on August 2017. Northern International was connected to Yi Jingming, who was connected to the communist regime. Now, we explained all that in our second speech, second speech just last Tuesday. Second, this statement shows several examples of wires from Hudson West III to CEFC. As Senator Johnson and I have established, that company is an arm of the communist Chinese regime. This new record shows how closely connected Hudson West III was with CEFC while Hunter Biden and James Biden received money from Hudson West III. Third, we've got a January 17, 2018 wire to Lion Hall Group. Now that happens to be James Biden's company. James Biden received $18,000 from Hudson West Three. The same month, that company sent money to CEFC. Now this is just one example of many. Accordingly, the official bank record makes clear the financial connections between and among James Biden and the communist Chinese elements. To the liberal media and my Democratic colleagues, is this the official bank record? Is that Russian disinformation as you accused us of spreading? Now let's go to the second poster. This is Hudson West three bank record from April 2018. Here you see wire transfers from Coal Harbor Capital. That company was connected to Merwin Yang, who was an associate of Yi Jingming and Gong Wen Dong. Now, as Senator Johnson, as I have already established, all of them are connected to the communist regime. These are the players in the game that I mentioned in the first speech last Monday. And now we've established they appear repeatedly in bank records with high dollar transfers. These transfers aren't by accident, no way. There's clearly a scheme here there's a plan among and between all these individuals and their respective companies, which then begs the question, has the Justice Department acquired these records? If so, what has the Justice Department done about these records? Now moving to the next transaction, there's another $165,000 wire. Again, that relates back to the LLC agreement that connected Hunter and James Biden to the Chinese firm CEFC and its projects in the energy sector. Then you have a $34,000 wire 
to James Biden's Lion Hall Group from Hudson West 3. So what was this all about? Let's take a look then at the third poster. Now look at the sixth line from the bottom. I want to quote, it says, office expense and reimbursement. That's the same reason given for the first poster that I showed you. We'll make all of these records public again this very day. For those of you who may still doubt my and Senator Johnson's oversight work, I'm going to present one last transaction to bring all of this home. So look at the fourth poster. In my and Senator Johnson's September 2020 report, we found that James Biden and Hunter Biden went on a $99,000 global spending spree courtesy of who? Another Chinese person that I've mentioned so many times in these three speeches, Gong Win Dong. The spending spree included airline tickets, purchases at Apple stores, hotels, and restaurants. This bank record next to me shows a $99,000 transaction in September 2013, or 2017. But that's not all that we have. Let's turn to the final poster. This is number five. This is a credit card authorization form for $99,000. So look at the bottom. There's the signature block with Hunter Biden and Gong Win Dong. Now, to the liberal press and my Democratic colleagues, are these official records Russian disinformation? So what's the point of all these records? Not only have Senator Johnson and I illustrated through new records that Hunter Biden was financially connected to the communist regime, these records show Jim, James Biden was as well. These new records show direct financial links between companies connected to the communist regime and James Biden through Lion Hall Group. These new records support the findings in our report to the last Congress. Remember, those reports were put out in September and November of 2020. And everybody was saying it was, it was uh, Russian disinformation. Forget the facts. Forget the evidence. Forget the investigative journalism. The liberal media wanted to provide cover for then-candidate Joe Biden. They did whatever they could to smear our investigations. With these new records, there can be no doubt that James Biden was financially connected to the corporations and the individuals with the extensive link to communist China, and that he and Hunter Biden were in it together, working to help a Chinese government-linked energy company pursue deals and expand its reach in the energy sector. Now is Senator Johnson's turn. On May the 9th of this year, Senator Johnson and I wrote to David Weiss, the U.S. Attorney for the District of Delaware. Now, he happens to be in charge of the Hunter Biden criminal case. In that letter, we asked Mr. Weiss a series of threshold questions that Attorney General Garland has repeatedly failed to answer. 
First, we ask whether Nicholas McQuaid is recused from the Hunter Biden case. As we have said publicly many times, McQuaid is conflicted because he worked with Hunter Biden's criminal attorney before he was hired as a top position in President Biden's Justice Department. Second, we asked Mr. Weiss whether he or any of his employees have had any communications with McQuaid. Third, we asked Mr. Weiss whether any of his employees, not just Mr. McQuaid, are recused from the Hunter Biden case. We ask these questions because the Biden family is from Delaware and has extensive political connections. Notably, Hunter Biden told his business partners, quote, I'll bring suit in the Chancery Court in Delaware, which as you know is my home state, and I'm privileged to have worked with and know every judge in the Chancery Court, end of quote. Does the Biden family have connections to anyone in Mr. Weiss's office? That seems to be a very fair question. With respect to those three questions, Mr. Weiss didn't even try to answer. In fact, the Attorney General jumped in and answered on behalf of U.S. Attorney Weiss. But calling the Attorney General's letters an answer is an overstatement. It was another non-answer, eventually just words on a piece of paper that didn't say anything worthwhile. So Senator Johnson and I also asked Mr. Weiss if he's received sufficient resources and support from the Justice Department to properly handle the Hunter Biden case. Again, no answers. One would think that the department, and specifically Mr. Weiss, would want to tell Congress and the American public that the answer to those, that question is yes. The failure of Mr. Weiss to answer that very important question adds to the growing concern and public concern that the Justice Department is pulling the punches on the Hunter Biden case. We also asked Mr. Weiss whether he's discussed the need for a special counsel or an independent counsel to properly investigate the Hunter Biden case. Again, no answer. The last question is more relevant today than when it was asked because the other week a voicemail was released reportedly from Joe Biden to Hunter Biden. In it, Joe Biden repeatedly left a message about a New York Times article that involved Hunter Biden's dealings with Yi Jingming. That business associate is closely connected to the communist Chinese regime. Joe Biden told his son, quote, I think you're clear, end of quote. Well, that message appears to show that Joe Biden was aware of Hunter Biden's business deals and relationships. So, the White House strategy for the president to continue to deny, deny knowledge of these business relationships falls very flat. On June 30th, 2021, and on June 28th, 2022, Senator Johnson and I wrote to the White House Consul. We wrote about then Vice President Biden's use of non-government email to transmit government information to Hunter Biden. The White House's Consul's office refuses to answer 
whether Pre President Biden still commutes, communicates government business to Hunter Biden, among other questions that we posed. So what do we get? More stonewalling. Most recently, on July the 7th this year, Senator Johnson and I wrote to the Attorney General, FBI Director, and U.S. Attorney Weiss. In our letter, we ask again about recusals, recusals of Hunter Biden's case. We also noted that recent reporting on Hunter Biden showed more connections between him and foreign nationals, this time Russians and Ukrainians. Those additional links further support my and Senator Johnson's conclusion in our September 2020 Biden report that Hunter Biden's activities causes criminal, counterintelligence, and extortion concerns. At the time, our findings were ignored or falsely labeled Russian disinformation by Democrats and by liberal media. We gave floor speeches on March 28th this year, March 29th this year, April 5th this year, that introduced bank records connecting Hunter and James Biden to the communist Chinese regime. The same connections that we made in our 2020 report. Those bank records have proven to be authentic and hence aren't Russian disinformation. For years, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle levied complaints against the Trump administration Justice Department for the lack of transparency. Now, why aren't those same Democrat colleagues raising this concern about this administration not showing the proper transparency? Congress has a constitutional responsibility to ensure the proper execution of and compliance with conflicts of interest laws and regulations. The failure of the Justice Department to comply with these rules will cause political infection to ran, run rampant. And of course, that'll rot the core of the Justice Department and cast a cloud over everything that the Department of Justice does. As I've said before, the Justice Department's failure to be transparent with the Hunter Biden criminal case and recusals related to it has cast a cloud over that investigation. So I ask, what is the Justice Department trying to hide? The American people's concern about how the case has been managed, these concerns are very legitimate. To Attorney General Garland, to Director Ray, and to Mr. Weiss, I strongly urge you to clear the cloud sooner rather than later. Marks he may have before we proceed with votes. We have agreed on a voice vote for Ms. Desai, and uh, I'm going to uh, uh, not oppose that nomination going out of committee. I want people to know, though, that I'm still studying uh, her uh, record to a greater extent, and we'll re be reviewing that before I decide how I'm going to vote on the floor of the Senate. I also would like to discuss two oversight letters that I made public this week. The letters relate to uh, a special uh, uh, assistant special agent in charge by the name of uh, Timothy Tebow. He's at the FBI's Washington field office. This FBI official engaged in active public partisanship in his public social media content. He also posted partisan anti-Trump, anti-Attorney General Barr material in his LinkedIn account. 
The matters he posted about included matters under his purview. He's now under investigation for potential Hatch Act violations. According to allegations that I have received, Tebow was deeply involved in opening an investigation into the Trump campaign. The Washington Post reported on that investigation this very Tuesday. However, the Post didn't report that Tebow was a prime mover in opening it. They missed that important data point. According to allegations <clears throat> that that investigation was substantially based on liberal news articles and information derived from a left-wing nonprofit. And it was a full investigation, not the preliminary that you usually start out with. Now contrast that investigation <clears throat> with the allegations that the FBI received negative information on Hunter Biden from multiple sources over a period of years. That investigation information involved potential criminal conduct. What did Tebow do with that information and those sources? According to whistleblowers, he shut it down, and the FBI headquarters team worked to falsely label that information as disinformation. What these allegations show is this. The Justice Department and the FBI green, uh, greenlit and investigation into the Trump campaign and yet shut down investigative activities with respect to Biden. Political bias has infected the Justice Department and FBI. Attorney General Garland and Director Ray must explain themselves to the Congress and the American people. Uh, before I end and, and want to ad lib this, I talked about the two letters I sent this week, but prior to that, maybe going back three or four weeks, I received this information from whistleblowers and I put out a press release and had a telephone conversation with uh, Director Ray. And at that point, uh, Director Ray had removed this person from these responsibilities he had and assigned someplace else. So I do want to uh, compliment Director Ray for taking that information to get this guy out of the uh, whatever organization they have in the Justice Department that decides that one person is going to decide and he and had partisan views of opening a case or closing a case. I yield. Thank you very much. I understand. It's responsibility to ensure that the executive branch executes the laws and uses taxpayers' money appropriate in accordance with congressional intent. It doesn't matter whether we have a Republican president, a Democrat president, a Republican Senate, or a Democrat Senate. We all have the constitutional responsibility of checking the executive branch. In further of that constitutional responsibility, Congress has an obligation to investigate the executive branch for fraud, for waste, for abuse, and even gross mismanagement. And if Congress finds potential wrongdoing, we have an obligation to the American people to make sure that it's public. Because transparency of the public's business brings accountability to those who conduct that public business. Last week, I made public two oversight letters that I've sent to the Justice Department and to the FBI. These two letters are part of my investigation into a political bias that's infecting the Department of Justice and the FBI. These letters are based on information provided to my office 
by whistleblowers. And I hope everybody knows that I consider whistleblowers as patriots. And whistleblowers have to have guts, and they do have guts. And Director Ray has personally told me that uh, these whistleblowers won't be subject to retaliation. As often, whistleblowers in the federal government are subject to retaliation, hurting themselves professionally and maybe even losing their jobs. Now, these letters that I sent follow up on a May 31, 2022 letter to the Justice Department, the FBI, and the Inspector General. In those letters, I provided evidence of extreme left-wing bias shown by a special agent in charge by the name of Tim Tebow. He is special agent in charge of the FBI's Washington field office. Now, he has since been referred to the Office of Special Counsel for potential hatchback, Hatch Act violations. Tebow is at the center of my two letters sent last week. The first letter relates to an FBI investigation that Tebow opened on the Trump campaign and its advisors. He allegedly had help from Richard Pilger, an official in the Justice Department's election crime branch within the public integrity section. During Chairman Turbin's investigation into the Justice Department misconduct, Pilger really stood out. The committee interviewed Richard Donahue, the former Principal Associate Deputy Attorney General during the Trump administration. He was also a key January 6th committee witness. Donahue testified to the Judiciary Committee that Pilger's conduct frustrated the department's ability to properly operate the elections crimes branch. Tebow and Pilger played a major role in opening the criminal investigation into the Trump campaign. And this isn't a preliminary investigation. It's a full investigation, which requires heightened standards to go forward with that investigation. According to the whistleblowers that contacted my office, the opening memo for that investigation is based on, is based in substantial part on liberal news reporting. Liberal news reports are not enough for a full investigation. The Washington Post reported on the investigation last Tuesday. However, the Post did not report that Tebow and Pilger were involved in opening that case against Trump and his advisors. Yet, Attorney General Garland and Director Ray allegedly approved opening those investigations. Now, as I have said in my letter to those two people, if you're going to open an investigation, you have to do it in the right way. So let's contrast this investigation with what the FBI has done with information received from sources relating to Hunter Biden. Whistleblowers have told my office that the FBI maintain, maintains many sources that have provided extensive information on Hunter Biden. That, invest, that information allegedly involves potential criminal activity such as money laundering. That's the same criminal concern that Senator 
Johnson and I raised in our 2020 Biden report to clarify. That was way back in 2020. According to the whistleblower's allegations, the underlying information was verified and was verifiable. Now here, now here is where it is appropriate to raise questions about politic and political interference in investigations. However, instead of green, green lighting the investigative activity, the FBI shut down the Hunter investigation. So now how did they do that? According to allegations in August 2020, FBI supervisory intelligence analyst Brian Oten opened an assessment. That assessment was used by the FBI officials to improperly discredit Hunter Biden's information as, you know what, disinformation. Those officials allegedly included Tebow. Then in October 2020, an avenue of additional Hunter reporting was ordered closed at the direction of Special Agent Tebow. It's been alleged that Tebow and others suggested to FBI agents that the information was at risk of being, you know what, disinformation. However, according to allegations, the source reporting was either verified or verifiable via cri criminal search warrants. Tebow allegedly ordered the matter closed without providing a valid reason as required by F. FBI guidelines, as required by FBI guidelines. In other words, Tebow shut down an allegedly legitimate avenue of information. So in order to shut down Hunter Biden's sources and investigative leads, the FBI engaged in disinformation campaign against itself and its own agents. If these allegations are true and accurate, the Justice Department and the FBI are and have been substantially corrupted. Before I conclude, I want to note four things regarding the summer of 2020. Yes, the summer of 2020. The opening of Oten's assessment in August 2020 Secondly, efforts by the FBI officials to shut down Hunter Biden's investigative activity. Third, efforts by the FBI to provide really unnecessary briefing to me and Senator Johnson in August of 2020. That briefing was purportedly about our Biden investigation, but it had nothing to do with the Biden investigation. Leaks, fourthly and lastly, leaks relating to the briefing and the liberal media and Democrats falsely accusing me and Senator Johnson of advancing Russian information. All those four data points happened as Senator Biden, or Johnson and I prepared to finalize our September 2020 Biden report. These data points show a plan was in place at the FBI to undermine anything related to Hunter Biden. Attorney General Garland and Director Ray, you both have an obligation to the country to immediately investigate these in allegations, and a clean house. And my oversight work on this and related matters will certainly continue. 
on another point and a much shorter point, just in case some of my colleagues are wondering how long I'm going to have the floor. Today I come to speak on the importance of inspector generals, IGs as they're called in this town. IGs play an important role watchdogging executive branch agencies. They help make, our, make sure that government bureaucrats are held accountable when they engage in waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayers' money. IGs are force multipliers for Congress in overseeing our responsibility of checks and balances of the executive branch of government. They're charged with keeping Congress informed of wrongdoing and to provide objective, nonpartisan recommendations on even the most politically sensitive issues. As of today, there are currently 13 IG vacancies throughout the federal government. Some have nominees, some don't have nominees, and some haven't had Senate confirmation IGs in years. Now to hone in on one vacancy that I've paid special attention to over the years is that of the Department of Defense Inspector General. Believe it or not, that office has not had a Senate-confirmed IG in more than six years. The Department of Defense has an annual budget of well over three, of well over $700 billion, and as today, it looks like they'll have a much more money the next fiscal year. Now, I've spent many years calling out waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayers' money at the Department of Defense, and I know full well that in the importance of having a Senate-confirmed IG in place at that very important department. Having an independent and effective watchdog at this point is critical to keep the Congress informed of all the tomfoolery that happens at the Pentagon. Whether that be paying exorbitant amounts of money for a hammer, constructing buildings in foreign countries that remain vacant to this day, or failing to hold contractors accountable. It all happens time and time again. We in Congress need a watchdog with teeth, not afraid to fight off the corporate fat cats who seek to enrich themselves off the backs of the American taxpayer. Some of these contractors have made careers from ripping off the taxpayers through wasteful spending at the Department of Defense. A few thousand dollars here, a couple million there, it turns out to be waste many times. We need a watchdog, an inspector general at this post, and we need it now. I believe my colleagues here in the Senate share my beliefs in the importance of having Senate-confirmed IGs in these vital roles. The President must act to nominate, and the Senate should confirm qualified and effective watchdogs to the vacancies like this, particularly the one at the Department of Defense. I yield the floor and suggest the absence of the court. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Uh, thank you, Chairman Durbin, and welcome to the committee, Director Ray. Uh, thank you for your service to the people of America. This committee has a constitutional obligation to ensure that the FBI complies with the laws that we write and execute those laws according to our intent. In performance of our constitutional duties, we often seek answers and records from the FBI. And if Congress finds potential wrongdoing, we have an obligation to the American people to make that public. The public's business ought to be public. Transparency brings accountability. Just last week, the Justice Department failed yet again to be transparent. The Department failed to provide underlying information to support their assumptions 
that a jury would not convict FBI agents for botching the Nasser investigation. This is beyond unacceptable. I've also asked the FBI about the steps it's taken to investigate Afghan evacuees that are considered significant security concerns. Senator Portman and Inhofe have done exactly the same thing. The FBI won't even tell Congress which field offices are responsible for these security matters. How does that make our communities any safer? Furthermore, based on the killing of al-Qaeda's leader this week, it appears that terrorist groups is, are still using Afghan, Afghanistan, as many of us, including you, Director Ray, have feared. The FBI must provide Congress concrete information about the national security and criminal risk of our communities, what they may face with respect to evacuees that weren't vetted properly. As we, as we all see, violence is a very major problem in America today. With rates of violent crime skyrocketing across the country, the start of this violent crime wave began in 2020 as police nationwide were pulled off the streets. Some of the main causes of this rise in violent crime are anti-police rhetoric, depleasing efforts, progressive prosecution, and bail reform. This crisis in policing is happening at the same time the progressive prosecutors refuse to hold violent criminals accountable for their crimes. Witness after witness in this committee has told us that bail reform movement helps to release violent criminals who are arrested so that they can go commit more crimes. Congress must treat violent crime as a top priority. So last week I introduced a bill entitled Combating Violent and Dangerous Cri uh, Crime Act. The bill contains common sense proposals to reduce the spike in violent crime in the nation, proposals that would expand federal prosecution options for offenses like murder, carjacking, bank robbery, and assault of police officers. The Justice Department and the FBI must also make violent crime a top priority. However, instead of doing so, it seems like the Biden Justice Department, the FBI, have focused on intimidating parents who are concerned about how schools treat their children. For example, it's been reported that the FBI has labeled parents with threat tags to track and investigate them. Contributing to the crime rave, this administration's failure to manage the border has been a, a drug trafficker's dream. What's the what is the result? Well, in 2021, we had over 100,000 drug overdoses. Fentanyl crossing that border was about 70% of that 100,000. Thanks to our open borders, drug traffickers are poisoning our streets, killing our children, and they're trafficking innocent victims with reckless abandon. This administration is failing the people by not securing the southern border. More recently, my colleagues have heard me on the issue of political bias infecting the FBI decision-making process. As Director Ray is aware, multiple Justice Department whistleblowers have approached my office about that political bias. Whistleblowers are patriots, and they also have to have lots of guts, and most of them do. According to whistleblowers, the FBI opened an investigation on the Trump campaign and, and its advisors. The opening memo for this Trump investigation is based in a substantial part on liberal news reporting 
It's also based on information derived from left-wing nonprofit. Based on allegations, Director Ray and Attorney General Garland reviewed the memo and approved a full investigation. Now, as I've said in my letter, if the FBI is going to open an investigation, you have to do it the right way. It appears that the right way was not done. So let's contrast this investigation with what the FBI has done with allegedly criminal information received from numerous sources related to Hunter Biden. Simply put, the FBI sh shut down investigative activity. In August of 2020, the FBI supervisory intelligence analyst opened an assessment. This August 2020 assessment served as the vehicle by which the FBI headquarters team falsely labeled Hunter Biden information as you-know-what disinformation. As just one example, to make my concern clear, in October 2020, an avenue of reporting on Hunter Biden was ordered closed. That Hunter Biden information related to potential criminal activity. According to whistleblowers, the reporting was either verified or verifiable via criminal search warrants. But it was shut down on the basis of it being at risk of disinformation. Based on allegations, the evidence didn't support that finding. So let's look at both of these fact patterns. On the one hand, the FBI greenlit a full investigation into Trump based on liberal news articles and information derived from liberal nonprofits. On the other hand, the FBI closed investigative activities and sources that provided verified or verifiable reporting on Hunter Biden. Director Ray, you'll have to explain to the committee and to the country how you manage this mess and how you'll clean house. In conclusion, I'm going to make one last point. In August 2020, and I hope my colleagues will pay attention to this timeline, in August 2020, Senator Johnson and I received an unsolicited and unnecessary briefing from the FBI. Now, this briefing reportedly related to our Biden investigation, but in the end, the briefing had nothing to do with it. The briefing was instituted after the FBI received pressure from my Democrat colleagues to do just that. The content of that briefing were later leaked in order to falsely paint the Grassley-Johnson investigation as advancing, you know what, Russian disinformation. That briefing was held the very same month. The FBI opened the assessment that was used to label Hunter Biden's information as, you know what, disinformation. Considering the timing of these events, the timing draws very serious concern. So I'm asking you, Director Ray, simply put, the FBI's credibility is on the line as the principles that help found and sustain our great nation are also on the line. Thank you. President. Senator from Iowa. Last week, while I was meeting with constituents in Iowa, news broke here in Washington, D.C. about Assistant Special Agent in Charge Tim Tebow's retirement. Since May 31 of this year, I've highlighted Tim Tebow's partisan bias and how it infected major FBI investigations. That included a July 18th letter of this year that highlighted his role 
in opening a criminal investigation into Trump's campaign and advisors. That investigation is the electoral investigation that's been in the news. For example, on July 26 of this year, the Washington Post reported on that very same Trump investigation. Now, however, the Post failed to note that Tebow was a prime mover in opening it. Now get this, the Post failed to note that Tim Tebow predicated the investigation in a substantial part on liberal news articles as well as information derived from a liberal nonprofit. Then Attorney General Garland and Director Ray approved a full investigation anyway, which, as we all know, was contrary to standard procedure for moving ahead on an investigation. That Washington Post article occurred one day after I made the Trump investigation letter public, and one day after I made the July 25th Hunter Biden investigation letter public. Since Tim Tebow's exit from the FBI, I've noticed more news articles and reporting that hasn't been accurate with respect to the allegations that I've made public. Let me take this opportunity then to correct the record with respect to that inaccurate reporting. Some reports have noted that the Hunter Biden criminal probe is ongoing. Therefore, how can the allegations of Tebow shutting down investigation activity related to Hunter Biden be a credible? Well, this is the difference. The whistleblower disclosures to me relate to investigative activity and avenues of information that originated entirely separate from the ongoing Hunter Biden criminal probe. That's why the allegations that I made that I've brought forward are so very, very important because we're dealing with a separate category of potentially criminal information relating to Hunter Biden that the FBI has within its possession. And the information received by the FBI was either verified or verifiable. Even so, based on allegations the investigative activity was shut down by Special Agent Tebow and, of course, by others based on the false assertion that it was disinformation. How many times do we have this disinformation coming up as an excuse all the time with Grassley's investigations? Now, to be precise, FBI officials wanted to take action with respect to this separate investigative information that the FBI had in its possession related to Hunter Biden. However, Tebow blocked the FBI from doing what would normally be done. Accordingly, the investigative activity and information cannot be advanced as it should have been, which means the FBI could have gathered more evidence with respect to Hunter Biden, but cut bait instead. And the FBI and Tebow cut bait 
right before the 2020 presidential election. Since the information and activity was shut down, it wouldn't have been initially shared with any ongoing criminal code. That calls into question then what U.S. Attorney Weiss is actually investigating. It also calls into question what the FBI's Baltimore field office is reviewing and whether it's the full scope of evidence. Now, I've asked Director Ray about that whole uh, issue. I ask him, quote, how can verified and verifiable information relating to Hunter Biden potential criminality be shared with U.S. Attorney Weiss if it is shut down? End of my quote. We have no answer from Director Ray. At the Judiciary's Committee August 4th oversight hearing, Director Ray said that it's his expectation that such information would be shared with relevant offices. So, Director Ray, I have this question. What have you done to ensure that your expectation has been met? Because Director Ray's failure to answer, Congress is unaware of whether or not the FBI has finally shared full and complete information and investigative activity with any ongoing criminal probe. Therefore, without additional transparency from the government, there's a very real chance the Hunter Biden criminal probe doesn't include the full evidentiary picture. Now, how can the American people trust the results? Some have also questioned how an assistant special agent in charge like Tebow can have so much power, power to open and close investigative activities. Well, that's exactly what he did. And that power is often abused within the FBI. For example, on March 28th of this year, Chairman Durbin and I wrote a letter to the FBI about an audit. That audit showed widespread violation of internal policies designed to ensure proper handling of the FBI's most sensitive investigations. To, to read from my letter with Chairman Durbin, quote, the FBI reviewed 353 sensitive investigative matters, just under half of all such matters that were pending during the, this 18-month review period, and identified 747 violations, end of quote. In 45 investigations, the FBI didn't conduct or document a legal review prior to opening it. In 40 investigations, the FBI officials who opened a sensitive investigative matter didn't obtain approval from the relevant special agent in charge or even the assistant special agent in charge. Now, with those statistics, I fear that's just the tip of the iceberg. In conclusion, let's look at Tebow's recent statement and the allegations he didn't address. I think we have five or six. First, he didn't address his role in opening a Trump investigation based on liberal news articles and information derived from a liberal nonprofit. Secondly, he didn't address his collaboration with Richard Pilger with respect to that investigation. Third, 
he didn't address efforts to water down the Trump investigation memo sent to Attorney General Garland and Director Ray, which they ultimately approved. Fourth, he didn't address the shutting down of the investigative activity and avenues of information relating to Hunter Biden. Fifth, he didn't address the alleged criminality within the information provided to the FBI about Hunter Biden. Six, he didn't address the August 2020 assessment opened by Brian Oten that was used to falsely label Hunter Biden's information as disinformation. Seventh, he didn't address his actions to try and improperly mark investigative closings so that they couldn't be opened in the future. Lastly, Thibault said that he, quote, welcomes any investigation, end quote, into allegations against him. Well, Mr. Tim Thibault, come on in. Sit for a transcribed interview with me and my colleagues. I yield the floor. Judge D Douglas has the support of both her, her home state senators in an unusual development for this administration's nominees. She's actually answered the question of whether or not she believed in a living constitution approach to judging. I want to take a few minutes to talk about Mr. Garcia's nomination to D.C. Circuit. Uh, he graduated from law school in 2011 and clerked for Judge Thomas Griffiths and uh, Justice Kagan. He w also spent a few years in private practice before joining the Justice Department earlier this year. Now, it's, it happens that we had a Trump nominee with very similar years of experience, a person that clerked for two prominent federal judges and a Supreme Court justice. Uh, Democrats at that time weren't impressed with that sort of recommendation, but they seem to be impressed with uh, a person that has uh, also demonstrated no abilities to serve, quote unquote, on a circuit court. So Mr. Garcia may have trouble getting those senators' votes unless those senators have a double standard. My opposition isn't because of his experience. I have concerns about judicial philosophy, uh, particularly approach to l religious liberty. Uh, he litigated against Catholic elementary schools, arguing that federal courts have the power to intervene in employment disputes involving teachers responsible for instructing students in the faith. That seems to be interfering in religious freedom. Additionally, we can hold a voice vote on the Speak Out Act bill. I'd like to applaud Senator Blackburn for her leadership on this bill. This is a very important issue, and the bipartisan bill will ensure that victims have the ability to speak out. I will vote yes on that bill. I'd like to also discuss, as you would expect me to, the Justice Department's and FBI's continued failure to respond to our oversight request. Starting May 31st this year, I've written three letters regarding political bias that seems to very clearly infected the FBI. Two of those letters provided specific and credible allegations based upon numerous whistleblowers. The allegations show a deeply rooted political infection that spread to investigative activities into uh, former President Trump and Hunter Biden. Based on allegations, the Justice Department and FBI approved investigative activities into Trump based on substantial, in a substantial part, 
on, can you believe it, just liberal news articles and information derived from liberal nonprofit. On the other hand, the FBI shut down investigative activities, which include verified and verifiable information related to Hunter. That activity was entirely separate from the ongoing probe by a Delaware U.S. attorney. The Justice Department, FBI, have failed to address the allegations that I've raised. So take notice. DOJ and FBI haven't even disputed these allegations. In light of the FBI's failure to respond on August 17th this year, I requested a comprehensive organizational chart with the Washington Field Office. The purpose of this request is to better understand how the Washington Field Office is staffed and who is responsible for the units and squads within the office. More importantly, it, it's to prepare for future congressional interviews. The FBI has failed to provide even an organizational chart. What's so secret about that? I don't know. Also on August 25th this year, Senator Johnson and I wrote to two FBI employees, uh, Nikki Flores, Flores, who's the intelligence analyst in charge of the Washington Field Office, and Bradley Bunevias, who's uh, deputy assistant director within the counterintelligence divisions. Now, these are the very same people that interviewed uh, or briefed me and Senator Johnson August 2020. That's the emphasis briefing that was only done because of Democratic pressure to do it. And I want to tell you, four powerful members of the United States House and Senate urged the FBI to brief us in regard to that. And simply put, we didn't learn a doggone thing from that briefing. It was set up so things could be leaked. Certain colleagues on the other side used that briefing to falsely paint our then ongoing Biden investigation as advancing Russian disinformation. Now, you all know that that was a put-up deal because even the New York Times and the Washington Post have said now that we weren't pursuing Russian disinformation. The FBI has failed to respond to our request for information about that briefing. Therefore, Senator Johnson and I have requested that these two employees sit for a transcribed interview with us. Now, we've received no response. The Justice Department and the FBI continue to thumb their nose at this committee's oversight jurisdiction. So, you know, we're not going to let up. My work to shine light on transparency in that department will continue just like it would with any department. I yield. I'd like to make one point for the record. When President Biden took office, he had over 90 U.S. attorneys who had been appointed under the previous administration. All but two were replaced. The two included the Northern District of Illinois, where John Losh it was investigating uh, political figures of the president and my political party. Uh, Senator Duckworth and I joined in asking that John Losh continue in this work. The same is true in Delaware, where the U.S. attorney was uh, retained uh, from the Trump uh, days of administration. Uh, and I think it was an effort by the administration, a valid effort, uh, to say that in this uh, delicate moment where uh, there were questions raised about certain investigations that we would not interrupt the continued uh, service of these two individuals. Turning I, I applaud the president for doing that, and I think I've said so two or three times, not only here, but in Iowa when I ask about it. But there's one little thing that we're still trying to get information on. When Tebow shut down that one investigation of Hunter Biden, I want to know, does he know about that information? 
or does it ever get to him? Because it seems to me it ought to be a part of this U.S. attorney in Delaware's investigation. I yield. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Turning to the agenda, first up is Judge Dana Douglas, who's been nominated to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Anyone seek recognition to speak on this nomination? If not, uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Leahy. Aye, by proxy. Mrs. Feinstein. Aye. Mr. Whitehouse. mention the Hunter Biden special counsel letter that Republican members sent to Attorney General Garland this week. The letter requests that special counsel protections and authorities be extended to uh, uh, U.S. Attorney Weiss. Senator Cornyn led the charge in getting that letter done. I thank him very much for his leadership in doing that. On May 9th of this year, Senator Johnson and I wrote to U.S. Sen Attorney Weiss, we asked him whether he acquired relevant records to fully advance the Hunter Biden investigation. Uh, we asked him uh, if he uh, received sufficient resources and support from the Justice Department to ex execute the investigation. We also asked him if he discussed the need for a special counsel to properly investigate uh, Hunter Biden criminal matter. Attorney General Gar Garland interceded and answered on uh, uh, Weiss's uh, behalf, although calling it an answer doesn't do the letter any justice whatsoever. It was another le letter with just words on a piece of paper. Moreover, it showed that maybe U.S. Attorney Weiss uh, isn't as independent as he should be if the Justice Department proper answers on his behalf. Now there's another reason why I joined Senator Cornyn's letter. Whistleblowers have presented allegations to me that the FBI had ongoing investigative activity into Hunter Biden in advance of the 2020 election. The whistleblowers disclosure to me relate to investigative activity and avenue of information that original, originated uh, separate from the ongoing Hunter Biden criminal probe, and it's related to potentially criminal conduct. Special Agent Tebow and others at the FBI shut down the activity right before the 2020 election. So I asked Director Ray the following, quote from our letter, when the FBI receives potential criminal information related to a matter that's the subject to investigation and prosecution by a U.S. attorney is that the FBI's standard practice to share that information with relevant U.S. attorney offices, end of quote. Director A said it was his experience that the information would be shared. Well, how can then that information be shared if it's shut down? The Justice Department, the FBI have failed to answer that very critical question. Therefore, as I've said publicly before, uh, there's a very real concern that the ongoing in, uh, criminal matter investigation didn't include the full scope of facts and evidence. The Justice Department, the FBI's failure to be transparent with Congress and the American people has cast a cloud over the Hunter uh, Biden investigation. Simply put, how can the people, American people, trust the results if the investigation doesn't include at least all of the known information? I yield. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Before we turn to the Bill S-673, I understand we can take an unblocked voice vote on two U.S. Marshal nominees. Thomas Brown to be U.S. Marshal for the Northern District of Georgia. Kirk Taylor to be U.S. 